Hi everyone, welcome to our Meet the Pioneers Community Growing. My name is Lindsay Chambers, I'm the Development Manager at Community Land Scotland. And this is the latest in our series of Meet the Pioneers where we hear from communities on different subjects. Uh, we have a huge range of Meet the Pioneers on our YouTube channel covering everything from housing to, to heritage assets. Um, but today we're going to be looking at community growing. It's a, an issue that's really risen up the agenda for lots of our members since the pandemic. So we knew there's a huge amount of interest in the subject. Um, just to run you through a few housekeeping points. So um, if you'd like to ask questions of our speakers today, please, please use the question and answer function. I'll pick up those questions. So if the questions are directed to anyone in particular, just write their name down and I'll make sure um, we ask the question of the right person. Uh, captions are available during this session. You can turn that, those on. Um, if you'd like to use the chat function to introduce yourself, share comments or network with other people in the session, you can do that. If you require technical support, just message my colleague Meg, Meg Tainter, who's running the webinar behind the scenes. And we're going to be recording today's session so that it can go onto our YouTube channel. So just to be aware of that as well. And um, we have three or well, four speakers today from three different organisations. Um, First up, we have Diane McNabb and Stephen Bevan from Cymru Orchard and Cymru Allotments. We then have Kate Dara from The Ridge. And then we have Karen Davidson from Social Farms and Gardens Scotland, who's going to introduce us uh, the support that they provide to communities in this area. After that, we'll have time for, for a Q&A session. So um, please do think of your questions as you're going along. So there'll be plenty of time at the end uh, to ask questions of the speakers. So as I said, first up, we have um, Cymru Community Orchard and Cymru Community Allotments. So our two speakers are Diane McNabb and Stephen Bevan. Diane McNabb is a lifelong amateur gardener who became involved in the orchard right back at its inception and in the first tree planting in 2010-11. She describes herself as an enthusiast rather than a professional, although it sounds like she's learned a lot about fruit trees, how to look after them and care for them and all their different characteristics. She really enjoys volunteering in the community and introducing children to the flavour of fresh apples. We also have Stephen Bevan, who has grown veg and soft fruit for years, although it sounds like his fruit tree growing was limited when he was in Orkney because he could only grow Victoria plums, but he became involved in the orchard after it was planted and has enjoyed learning about managing fruit trees. He also described himself as an amateur and uh, the whole group is a very enthusiastic group of like-minded amateurs. Stephen also has an allotment adjacent to the orchard and is involved in the recently planted community woodland. So I'm going to hand over to Diane Stephen now. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, um, Diane and I are based in Cymru in Perthshire. Um, it's a small community, um, just over 2,000 people living in the village. Um, and the development of our community growing activities, the orchard, the allotments, and, and more recently our woodland became possible because of the presence of Kelty Bracken Camp on the periphery of the village. This, is a, this was Camp 21 built in the early 1940s as prisoner of war camp. Um, and in, in 1948, um, its function changed. It became an army training camp and finally closed in 2004. There's over 80 Nissen huts on the, on the site. They were, they were built with a life expectancy of something like 15 years. And here we are 82 years later, and they're still all there. And that's a mixed blessing because they are they're listed because of their historical importance, which makes development problematic, but it also enhances the, the, uh, the heritage value of the camp. Um, and it's the last remaining prisoner of war camp in Scotland. Excuse the phone. Um, Cymru Development Trust was launched in 2006, and that was after some liaison with people from the Western Development Trust, a very successful de development trust in Orkney. The camp was purchased in 2007, and a public consultation took place in 2008, which showed a very clear desire for both community orchard and allotment development on the site. The community woodland followed later. Um, the allotments were established in 2009. We've got 31 whole plots, though many of them are now subdivided and, and many people are satisfied with half plots. Um, we have a, a rolling 10-year tenancy agreement with Cymru Development Trust for the allotment site. 
And we've got the, the good fortune of, of having both, well, we, we've got water, we've got toilet facilities, we've got one of the Nissen huts, so we've got a meeting place, um, we've got a kitchen. So in some respects, we're a bit different to some other, other allotments. Um, the community woodland was something that developed rather later, and that was because of the huge amount of work that was needed to establish it and, and get grant applications in and so on. And I think as the, the, the grant landscape changed, it became possible to get funding. Um, and we, we got our grant three years ago and got around to planting two years ago, and things are going very nicely there. So there are two strands of what we've got. Um, I'll hand over to Di now, who's going to say a bit more about the orchard. Hi, hey, hello everybody. Um, I've been involved in the Comrie Community Orchard work group really since the inception and the planting um, of the orchard. So that was back in 2010, 2011. The main planting took place here in April, 2011. Um, you can see there some of the um, assault course area, the, the trees in the background there also of the, um, the firing range. Um, at this, the, that's in the Northwest corner of the camp just beyond uh, the allotments, but we made use of the assault course to be able to have um, uh, cordons and espaliers trained onto the walls and onto the bars, and that's been really quite successful. Uh, at the same time, we planted a, uh, an edible hedge to the north of the orchard and around the uh, east side. So that's a hedge with things like hazels, uh, hawthorn, uh, sea buckthorn, uh, wild cherry, and so forth, and um, elderflower. And this is now forming a very nice uh, windbreak around those areas of the, of the orchard. Um, we can move on now to the next slides. So here you can see, uh, Oh, can we go back to the to the pruning, the pruning section? That's it. Yeah, you can see us, see us here busy at work in the winter time, and you can see us on the assault course here pruning uh, the apple trees. So the the pruning takes place in the early part of the year, January, February, and on into sometimes into March. This is the main activity of the early part of the year. Then coming on into springtime, we have to weed and uh, take care around the trees, checking to see there's not been a major rabbit damage or um, damage to the tree guards. And we add manure to trees that we think need it, mulch and, and so forth. Um, we can move on now to show you the blossom, which is coming out now. Yes, here's the blossom, um, which is coming out at the moment. We've already had apple blossom, oh, the um, sorry, the pear blossom and plum blossom. Unfortunately, the bullfinches have taken quite a bit of our plum blossom, which is a bit sad. Um, but the apples are gradually coming on, and we planted um, some extra trees like willow and um, flowering currant and some crab apples to try and encourage more um, pollinating insects to come into the orchard. And we're lucky enough to have um, bees in the camp, at least six hives of bees in an enclosed area. So that's a great benefit. And um, then we move on to our apples themselves, pictures of our apples themselves. We have 40 plus varieties of apples. Can we go on to the apple pictures? Yes, you can see some, some just there, okay. Um, so those, you can see one lot are trained on um, one of the bars with, you can see the Nissen hut in the background um, and the others are against the wall. So one lot are espaliers and then the cordons. 
Um, yes, as I say, we've got more than 40 varieties of apples, but we do have other fruit trees in the orchard. We have plums, um, morello cherries, um, gauges, damsons, and even um, we have quinces and uh, medlars, gauges, I've said already. And then we do have some soft fruit, quite an area of soft fruit, which requires quite a lot of maintenance too. Black, black and red currants, gooseberries, and a cage of blueberries. So plenty of work to be carried out. So if we can go on to the next um, slides, next, next pictures. Yeah, this is the main event of the year. So come September, October time, we start harvesting the apples. And um, Stephen next to me uh, created almost single-handedly a wonderful uh, storage story shed where we, we put the apples before Apple Day. Um, so this is the height of the season for us, really, and the height of activity when we need plenty of help. Um, we take in all the apples and we sell some apples. And as you can see here, we're um, discussing the, the varieties of the apples that have been put out on the table. And then we sell some apples. And then the rest of the apples are juiced. They're juiced and made into fresh juice and pasteurized juice. Uh, so really there's, there's no wastage. And this is the time of the year when we, you know, we raise the funds that we need to maintain the orchard and to buy equipment and, uh, and so on. And for the last few, two, three years, this, um, the Apple Day has been held in the firing range, the old firing range of the, uh, uh, of the camp undercover because uh, Jim Thompson, who has, uh, this is a woodworking area, kindly lets us move into a very nice enclosed space. So I think the next slide should show the juicing activity going on. Next slide. We are lucky enough to have uh, very good yeah, equipment. So on your right is what's called uh, the scratter, which really pulps, makes the um, apples into pulp. And then we have a very good um, press, hydraulic press, so we can get as much juice out of the apples as, as possible. And then I think some slides below. Maybe the children. Some more slides. Perhaps we're moving on to discuss biodiversity. Uh, yeah, the, I thought there was one of the children. Just they're having a look at the juice that's coming out of the press. And that's a trug full of lovely juice. So then I was going to go on to talk about the biodiversity in the area, because since um, the allotments moved in and since we um, planted the orchard, the biodiversity has certainly improved. Bird life has increased enormously and gradually we're improving the plant biodiversity. And here you'll see um, the yellow is all yellow rattle. So we planted only a really a small, sowed only a small amount of seed and it's gradually spreading throughout the orchard and reducing the, the strength of the grass and hopefully the, then allowing other wildflowers to grow. Um, in the next picture, I think you'll see some of the wildflowers that are on our what we call our beetle bank. Um, these are quite strong wildflowers. In the next slide, um, we've got, ah, no, this is children in the, having fun in the camp. We had a bug hunts, the brownies, I spy in the orchard. Um, certainly it's a, a lovely chase, place for children to be. And 
Once a week, there's still a toddler play group that comes each Friday morning to use the space. That's okay. And now we're on to back to a little bit of biodiversity. On the bank, we have things like ragged ro robin and toad flax. And we have allowed a few nettles to remain and um, rose bay willow herb. And then going back a little bit to the maintenance there, scything um, is going on here because late in the season come August when uh, the yellow rattle has died down and some of the other wildflowers, we scythe or mow the, um, the grass and, and gather in uh, the hay. Um, and thinking about the things that happen in the orchard, uh, we've had courses in um, pruning, grafting, uh, even hedge laying and scything. And I think another scything course is about to happen and I think next month. Um, there's also been one, one and another wedding coming up in the camp and one or two people have had um, anniversary meals served to them in the camp and the place is generally very well uh, very well visited and very well used. So come and see if you haven't been already. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Diane, Stephen. That was really interesting and has really made me want to go and eat an apple now. Um, we're having some minor technical challenges. Um, the chat is, doesn't seem to be working, so just put anything you want to say or comments or anything on the Q&A. And apologies on the slides. I know Meg is hitting them, but they've been taking about 30 seconds, you think, to actually come up on the screen. So that's why there was a bit of a delay on that. But they were beautiful photographs. Um, we're going to go on to the Ridgeland and Bar now. So I'm just going to introduce Kate Dara, who's going to give us a presentation about their work. Kate spent 16 years teaching and then retrained in horticulture through the Royal Horticultural Society. She followed this by a full-time study at the Royal Botanical Gardens and the Scottish Agricultural College in Edinburgh and has been involved on the committees of local community groups. So over to you, Kate. Sorry, just trying to do this on my phone, having um, crashed my uh, audio on my laptop. So um, apologies for slightly clunky technology here. Um, I couldn't actually see the, the slides at all, which may be um, was due to my being on my phone, but it sounded absolutely amazing what's going on um, up there. And uh, I, what we're doing in Dunbar is a, is a bit different, but has, um, has some strong crossover. Um, I, as, as you just said, though, um, my, my background was in teaching and then retrained in horticulture. And I had thought that the ridge in Dunbar was going to, which I set up uh, now 11 years ago, was going to be um, mostly about gardening um, and food production and maybe have a restaurant. And it was all about training and providing high quality skills training for folks for whom in particular school wasn't a great option. Um, but uh, it's kind of grown arms and legs. And uh, I don't know if everybody can see the slides, but um, I'm, I'm standing in today for Maggie McColl, who is uh, now our, our Director of Services and oversees the garden side of things. I do know what I'm talking about because I, I set the thing up and I ran the garden side of things for a long time. And I obviously, as Managing Director, still very much have an oversight. But um, Maggie has very kindly provided me with some slides, which include a lot of words. Um, the things that she wanted me to communicate to you. So I'll try not to just read out the slides, but uh, starting with our constitution, just basically, I think Maggie wanted me to let you know that uh, the, the, the food production and the, um, the transformation of vacant and derelict sites in Dunbar was, a, was a, a core part of our vision and became a core part of our constitution when we set up as a, as a charity. Um, and, and also the training, uh, skills training element of things is very central to what we do. So we, we really focused on supporting folk who are marginalised locally and who are struggling a bit. And um, of, of course, gardening provides the most fantastic uh, 
um, venue and vehicle for people to um, to heal their lives when they're struggling with mental health issues. And a lot of folk was particularly with addiction issues as well. It's a very soothing and restorative and positive thing to be involved in and the connection with other people as well as a really important aspect of that. But practically people are learning skills to, to grow their own produce um, and to understand and engage with, with nature and the environment in a more positive um, positive way. So that's, that's why there's a slide there about our constitution. The next slide. Uh, mentions our two gardens. We actually started out in the garden at Belhaven Hospital, community hospital, um, which is about uh, about a mile and a half, I guess, from the centre of Dunbar. Um, and we ran for Sustaining Dunbar, which is a community development organisation locally. We ran the set up the garden there, which was great. But there were issues with being in an NHS garden a little bit far from the centre of town. And really, we needed to be where where people were. Uh, so we ended up in the backlands, which was a derelict site, and um, it's been transformed by people coming and volunteering. We do have staff. Um, we now across the whole of the ridge from having had no staff at all and just myself and another volunteer. Um, we have 32 paid employees, not all working in the garden, um, a number of them in the garden. And uh, so we do have employed folk working in the garden, but it is a, very much a place where our clients uh, who are being supported by our support team come and uh, and benefit in all the ways I've just outlined. So the backland garden was the first garden we took on behind the high street in a, one of these long, thin rig gardens, um, which is such a sort of traditional part of a Scottish borough townscape behind the high street building. And the the transformation of that site of the of the land and then more recently of the buildings, the ruined buildings at the head of the the plot are just such a lovely metaphor for, for the transformation in people's lives. Um, and that's always just the most beautiful thing to see. So there aren't pictures there, particularly of, of the garden, um, beyond the close-ups of, of fruit and, uh, sorry, of, of food and, and, um, and flowers and of some of the youngsters that come and do all sorts of um, fun things around artistic, sort of getting dirty and, and making things, pushing on clays, making food learning about growing food and making food and all the, the enjoyment that they get out of that. Um, so we also have more recently, uh, and this happened during lockdown, we took on another vacant and derelict background site, which is a bit larger because the background during lockdown was too small really for us to have more than a couple of people physically distanced at any one time. And people were really missing um, contact and structure and activity during lockdown, of course. And so we asked the council if we could use another of the, these sites that they owned that was just sitting um, as, as a waste ground behind the high street. And they agreed to that. And another beautiful garden has been created there. If you look on our website or on our um, Facebook page, you can see pictures of, of both those gardens. And the backlands garden is full of um, raised beds, where produce is grown. Some of those have been sort of adopted by a dementia carers group and by at different points by groups like the guides and the scouts um, and also used by our volunteers and clients. Um, and the Empire Close Garden has become something more of a, a productive garden. Uh, sorry, not productive, an ornamental garden. It was started out as a productive garden, but something we found, and this is in a way kind of a shame that it plays to gender stereotypes, but we have found that the guys want to do landscaping um, on the whole, that's not all of them, um, but um, a lot of our, our female clients really enjoy growing flowers. Um, and so that's something that we've we've really developed something around um, a group who, who've been suffering with domestic abuse, uh, who are really benefiting from growing the most beautiful flowers and, and we're selling them to local florists. Um, they're being requested by uh, through the local florists for weddings and so on. And that obviously is hugely satisfying in terms of the sort of reducing um, the air miles that unfortunately are involved in a lot of commercial um, flower selling. Um, so that's a, a it's a beautiful thing to look out the window and see and to go in amongst and the polytunnel bursting with um, with gorgeous flowers. We have a big collection of David Austin roses 
We've got fantastic peonies. We're just coming to the end of the tulip season. We also run a, um, a bucket uh, system where we bought a whole load of little, uh, well, of black buckets and written the ridge on them. And you pay five pound deposit for your bucket. Um, and as the, as the flowers become ready, we have a WhatsApp group which anybody can join. And Lorraine, who heads up the garden team, posts what's available and how much each sort of bucket is going to be. And you run along with your bucket and pay to get your flowers. And I, I'm a member of it. And it's, it's always sold out. And it's, it's actually making a nice bit of profit for the ridge as well, which, of course, we can then feed back into buying plants and various other bits and pieces that we need. Um, I was interested hearing about the you know, summary that you've got um, you've got toilets and so on and how different that is from a lot of a lot of folk that are trying to run community gardens. We've been incredibly fortunate that we were donated to fantastic waterless toilets for this garden. The backland has currently a, a not very pleasant um, composting toilet. It works, but it's not. Um, nobody loves emptying it. Uh, these waterless toilets are from a French company called Woohoo, um, and they are they're absolutely great. They look like um, they look a bit like the miniature whiskey uh, distilleries with a big chimney and a rotating top that takes away the the smell. Um, and we're left fairly quickly actually with with usable compost, which can be used on not on we can put it on um, food. But it can be used in the in the flower growing so um absolutely fantastic and they look great they're very cool um i'm sorry i haven't got a slide to be able to show you of them but uh, that's that's one way in which we've been very fortunate as well and what a difference it makes so going on to the next slide um this is just about the fact that our support team makes great use of the of the um the gardens the support team offer a whole load of different supports to try and help people to build their skills to, to lead their lives as, um, as, as as far as possible fulfilling their potential and for most people that means moving into the, the dignity of paid work and we know that that's not ever going to be the case for absolutely everyone but for most people even if it's a very long journey it's a journey that is probably the most fulfilling. So we're tackling all sorts of issues. I mentioned mental health and addiction, a lot of people just really struggling with loneliness and loss of confidence and lack of basic life skills. Um, and lots of people whose lives have been affected by trauma and in very many different ways. So the, uh, yeah, the support team is a really massive part of what we do now, although our, you know, our big focus is around training. Um, so the next slide, talks about our training. Um, we're an FQA, Scottish Qualifications Authority accredited um, centre, and we deliver national progression awards in construction and um, national certificates in um, rural skills, which basically the bits of it we choose to deliver are, are around horticulture, could be doing animal husbandry and all sorts else. And we do, do still work with the garden at Belhaven Hospital for provision of a lot of that because they have a lot more space. And so, um, you know, pruning fruit trees and mowing grass and that sort of thing is not really possible in our smaller town centre gardens, but we can go out and do that um, at the community garden down at the hospital. So we, uh, we're delivering those courses in particular to, um, to school kids who come from across all six schools in East Lothian, and we have a contract with the council to deliver that, which again brings a bit of money in to allow us to employ people who are then able to support the, the work in the garden um, and in the support team more broadly. We also have a construction company, so we have a charity, which is the SCIO, the Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisation, the Ridge SCIO. Uh, and it has a wholly owned um, uh, trading subsidiary called the Ridge Foundations. And the Ridge Foundations is a construction company that has um, training, again, at its heart and provides opportunity for folks who wouldn't otherwise be able to access or sustain um, this sort of training and employment. But because we have the support team, when the wheels come off the bus, as they inevitably do, the support team is there to help people to, to put the wheels back on um, and we have our first two graduates of, of uh, in joinery and stonemasonry have come through this last year and both of them are actually staying with us because of our expanding team. That wasn't the model we were planning on. We thought we would just be preparing people to move out to work elsewhere, but actually we need them as part of our team. Um, and these photographs, you can see one of our one of our small 
backland projects. This is sort of alongside the um, the uh, at the top left there. It's alongside the, the main backland garden and behind one of the the buildings that we've taken ownership of and are restoring with the foundations team. Um, and that's a group of school youngsters who worked with the dementia carers group to design and um, and create a garden, which they, they just completed just before lockdown. It became known as the sanctuary garden. It stayed open throughout lockdown and people were able to come and sit on benches and, um, and meet each other on separate benches as outdoors, which was a really precious thing in, in a town centre. Um, and the rest of those photographs you can see at the bottom as well There's some adults who came to do um, a training course, which was focused around trying to build people's skills who've not been in employment for a long time and maybe needed confidence and, uh, and a bit of a, a, a kickstart to getting themselves back on the route back towards work. And they did a tasters of all sorts of things like um, joinery and masonry, but also building dry stone dikes and that's them out rebuilding a wall for a local farmer, which was much appreciated. They did green woodworking, which was really, really popular, um, and various other bits and pieces. And in fact, a couple of them progressed into becoming apprentices um, already with us. So it's been it's been really transformational. One one girl who had um, not been allowed by her very abusive partner to um, to work at all, but was actually incredibly skillful and is now um, doing amazing work with us as a joinery apprentice um, and come on in light years in terms of confidence and um, yeah it's just very very lovely to see and down at the bottom right hand corner that's one of our um, school groups who's been involved in making a um, I think that was that was a table special design table that they made so going on to the next slide I've already because I didn't make these slides forgetting the order they're coming in the rich foundations I already mentioned about and uh, this is the, the company the construction company um, which top left hand corner there you can see Mark who's our oldest apprentice uh, Mark came to us uh, straight out of jail um, he, had, he was a lifelong alcoholic and um, had obviously not been able to drink in in jail and decided he wanted to make that the opportunity to stop drinking uh, but needed something to do to keep himself busy and his son Darren um, was with us through the school group and he came along to the garden to see what Darren was up to and got involved in the very beginning of the, the Ridge Foundation starting and he has absolutely transformed his life. He's, he's now incredibly skillful as a stonemason. He decided really belatedly in his mid 40s that he wasn't going to stand by while his son got a, as Mark is also, sorry, Darren is also a um, a uh, an apprentice stonemason with us he's the one that's just graduated and mark wasn't very pleased that his son was getting a better qualification than he had so he decided he was going to be an apprentice as well and he's going to graduate uh next june just coming june so um yeah so there's mark with a bench that he's made and on the right hand side that's a garden shed that was built by the um the joinery team for another community garden not far away from here at gilmerton gilmerton wall garden and on the bottom you can see um a before and after um not from the same position so it's not well roughly from the same position it's not very easy to see but that's one of the buildings at the head the ruins at the head of the um the backland garden and we took ownership of the of the garden and of the buildings as part of East Oden Council's first ever community asset transfer. And we had, when we took on the site, we had absolutely no experience of building restoration. Uh, so it was <laughs> a bit crazy um, and a bit daunting, but we set up the company by then and just thought this would be the most fantastic vehicle for us to use to, to save this ruin. And that's actually cleared on the left-hand side there. It was so full of rubble that you could, uh, you couldn't actually see the, the ground floor doors and windows at all. And there's a, we've already in the, that window also taken out a, a um, 20 foot high sycamore out of one of the walls. And on the right hand side, bottom right hand side, you can see that the building has been restored. And that was done with very close supervision from Historic Environment Scotland and was a, featured in one of their magazine articles um, about a plastic free rebuild and it won an award at the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings Award for Sustainable Conservation and that, just like I was saying about the gardens and how amazing it is seeing the transformation of the of the waste grounds into beautiful productive sites 
this building has been the most extraordinary transformation brought about by trainees, all of whom came with no skill in in this sort of work and with all sorts of problems in their lives and to have seen how they have transformed their own lives in the process of of restoring that building um, and, and then getting this really prestigious national award um, has been just wonderful and for them absolutely wonderful and something that you know people locally said well you should just pull it down pull it down and build something modern um, and for them to also have been I think pretty much rejected and, and discounted locally where they were problem people frankly to now be the people that have restored this really important part of our local uh, heritage which which everybody now is like oh my goodness can't believe you did it you were you know we we pretty much have to eat our words because they're they're absolutely impressed by it and that means everything to the guys and girls because we do have girls in the foundation team as well whose whose hard work and skills learning and determination has gone into creating that so the the ridge foundation team um do also do external jobs they go out and um, restore people's houses. They do jobs for the council, for Historic Environment Scotland, um, for churches, um, and that generates income. And that income has, over the past couple of years, created a small surplus. And that surplus then goes back into supporting the other work that we do within the charity. And I'm sure anybody that's involved in um, in anything in, in involving volunteering and needing to fundraise knows how much pressure there is on funds these days and how hard it is to, to fundraise when you know everybody is just so desperately um, competing with each other sadly to, to, to get the, the small amount of funds that are available. Uh, so any and I, I think the other problem being that you know trying to raise money for um, core funding that for there are particular things that funders like to fund and it's usually things it's not usually salaries or if it is salaries it's a short term project and it has to be shiny and new and that's very difficult if you want to create a sustainable long term provision and keep doing what works um, so so this is this is free income, if you like, in the sense that it's not restricted, it's available for us to use for core costs. So it's a really important part as well in that way um, for us as an organisation in terms of our sustainability. And I guess finally, just to say that these buildings, so that's one of the one of a number of buildings, there's Blackboard Close where that is, which um, where we're building a support centre and a training room and um, a team office and so on. But that building it's currently got a workshop in it downstairs and um, a room that will be available for rent upstairs. On the other side of that, in Flesher's Place, we're building a therapeutic centre, but with two flats, studio flats above, which will be available for crisis accommodation that the council will pay to, to use. We're building other accommodation and um, a very big restoration job, which will have a shop and commercial space and let flats. Um, including some sheltered accommodation that we'll manage ourselves. Uh, and we're making a skills training centre. And everything that we're doing around these restoration projects is looking at meeting local needs, but also trying to build into that um, income generation so that we can be sure to be able to keep delivering and um, the, the support that's needed locally through our services. So I think that was the last slide. There we are. I hope I haven't run on for too long and I hope you could see the slides. Uh, thanks, Katie. I could see the, the slides very well. It was really interesting to hear all the different things that you're involved in at the Ridge. Um, we'll move on to our last speaker now before we come back to everybody for a Q&A session. So I'm going to hand over to Karen Davidson now, who is a Scot Scotland Advisor for Social Farms and Gardens, which supports a lot of our members around community gardening, community growing and green spaces. Um, Karen coordinates the Community Land Advisory Service Scotland as Chair of Grow Green Scotland, which is a new scale that coordinates Get Growing Scotland, supporting all models of growing food in the community. So over to you, Karen. Can everyone hear me? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. Brilliant, thank you so much. Super fantastic to hear about these two um, amazing enterprises. And it just shows you when you start off with a bit of green space and with some horticulture ideas, you end up in, in amazing spaces supporting your community. Um, so yeah, I am 
social farms and gardens in Scotland. I'm only a couple of days a week, um, but I link up with other work that provide that enables me to collaborate. So you can hear about social farms and gardens, but also um, get growing Scotland, of which we participate um, in. So, sorry, next. So social farms and gardens. It's got since 1700 here, but we haven't done a we haven't done a um. Sorry, I can hear someone talking. I don't know that. Anyway, so yes, so we've got 40 plus years experience. We've got 400 members in Scotland. So I'm getting a back. Are you hearing me? Are you getting a back? Yeah, yeah I can hear you and I can't hear anybody else. I'm hearing an echo from myself. I don't know why. <laughs> so our members include anything from care farms, which are often... Um, enterprises, big farms um, and agriculture businesses who have a certain amount of, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> so basically we have 400 members in Scotland, but they it goes from urban to rural to everything you can think about, to be absolutely honest. Um, and we do have um, smaller rural urban people who are quite engaged with us, people who aren't as engaged with us, but what we find is that the more engaged with it they are with us, the more that we learn and share with each other and work together. But um, and uh, not such a nice figure to put out there, but um, the areas of multiple deprivation one and two in Scotland. And that's something, you know, as we talk about funding, as Kate knows, you have to sometimes put those figures in. But I'd say about over half of our members um, are in areas where there you've got significant challenges around poverty and, and uh, other things. So basically, the, we also have, um, we work together with the um, community, we, so there, I've got some back, I can't hear myself, it's terrible because there's some back thing going on, um, I don't know what's going on here. So I'm going to start that slide again, I've got some kind of a, I'm hearing myself, sorry about that. Um, so basically, um, the focus of our work around, when it comes around land is the Community Land Advisory Service. And the Community Land Advisory Service um, is a unique thing in Scotland, and it's, it provides technical information and technical expertise around planning. Are you seeing the same slide as I'm seeing or something more funny going on? Sorry. I don't know what's going on with my slideshow, but... <laughs> um, so anyway, so... Can everyone still hear me? There's, I'm not getting, I think there's yeah, something wrong with my, I think it's my broadband, sorry, it's keeping dipping in and out. I'm really sorry about that. I don't know why it is, but it's not fully connecting and I'm unconnecting and connecting. I'm just gonna go from here. So we work with um, Get Growing Scotland. So Get Growing Scotland is was the Community Growing Forum Scotland. It, it started out as a, um, just a bunch of people getting together with to, to help work on the Community Empowerment Act about 12 years ago with the Scottish government. And the forum includes Social Farms and Gardens, Keep Scotland Beautiful, Green Space Scotland, Propagate, Glasgow Allotment Forum, Fife Council, Transition Edinburgh South, Highland Food Partnership. So it's a real mix of people, about 16 of us, who support mostly through advocacy. So we do a lot of work on consultation. Um, and at the moment, there's a lot of consultation going out there. We'll hit, hit on that in a minute. But we believe that every person who wants to grow food, food has the skills and land to do so and support to do so. So as we have some key, key products, and these are all kind of shaping up and coming together now uh, post COVID. During COVID, we helped just a lot of organizations keep going and keep running because of the issues um, about not being able to be on site, et cetera, et cetera. So um, as we were coming out of COVID, we were able sort of to reset what, what people wanted and what kind of advice they wanted. So Help At is a free advisory service for, service for community groups, and that is on everything you can think of from the horticulture side, site design, governance, um, everything. And the land aspect of that is, is, is by social farms and gardens through the Community Land Advisory Service. We've also got something new, and that's a way, it's a one year only offer because of the, the funding situation, but it's for everyone. It's kind of pushing out there, pushing out the boundaries to get more people volunteering, more people realizing that they can they, you know, look at some public land and get land to grow in. So that's pushing out some information um, by helping people get the confidence to grow. Because a lot of people start growing and don't food and just don't do it anymore. So that's called Grow Six. And you'll be able to see that online. And that's helping people to figure out six crops, how to grow them. And it's more than that. It's more of an introduction to a lot of communities, community centers, community groups throughout the country 
to be able to say, um, have you ever thought about growing? What about that piece of land? Um, once again, back to our vision that everyone should have a place to grow um, and, and if they want one. So that's a way of practicing skills, learning stuff, peer-to-peer uh, -peer support. So it's going to go on until um, what's that good? end of April next year. And it's just started. So that's a year long program about growing more food all year round. So a lot of the focus of community growing used to be about humans, really, and sort of their well-being. But since COVID, what we've seen a big transition to people actually wanting to grow more food and the idea of food security and these, some of the other climate nature emergencies is really transformed people's views, I would say at least half our 200 members are, are growing more food now. And um, whereas food was more of a community development tool for a lot of them. So growing food and finding more land is really, really important. How do we find more land? Um, or if you're a landowner, and there may be some landowners on here who, who have got land in the community, bought land for their community. What I would say to them is, you know, consider how you would do, use that land with your community. And um, we see, we're seeing a lot of, um, people using land, um, landowners, private landowners um, and community landowners and public landowners um, wanting to share land. So this is, a, this is a big, big change, I would say, in the last few years of what's going on. So as, as a group, we continue to advocate so that everyone has the opportunity to, to grow. Um, but land is going to continue to be an issue um, because we are always competing for land, the growing spaces with other, with other, other um, needs like housing so um we have to keep on advocating on you know how we can all fit into the land so to speak so i would encourage you to look at the community land guide if you have it it's got templates it's got lease information it's got all kinds of information um um to to see you know where to get started if you haven't managed to get started yet i would also say that um you need the community land advisory service on the Get Growing website, so that's back to this one, the Get Growing website, that service um, will, has a, it's starting to build a lot of in the land stories. So we're starting to get a lot of information, a lot of stories, because everyone has a land story, how they got their land for growing, what they're using it for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is starting to build a whole case. If you want to be part of that, please do join in the land stories. The more we spread it, the more people can pick up on the models. So, um, I get for us, we were, you know, we were, I was asked to look at how do you start growing? And I think a lot of people on here maybe already are going, look at who, who's involved, but it's not a linear process. And I have to say that our land advisory service, we could be contacted by someone, they don't come back for six months, and then we're busy working with them for six weeks. They come back another six months later, depending on whether they're looking for support on leases, support on planning, support on site design. Um, so, uh, um, they've all gone through a similar process, no matter what size, shape, rural, urban, all of the processes are similar. So you've got, you've got to engage your community and you'll know this, the conversations. I don't think we need to call it community consultation because as long as you can prove you've engaged people, it doesn't have to be as extreme as that, but unless it's a really big land purchase. Everyone has to look at their vision objectives, governments and operational model. Everyone has to identify land. Who owns the land? Is it public, private? What's the suitability of the land um, around contamination, soil health services, um, securing land is, I have to say over 90% of social farms and gardens members, in fact, probably more than that, do not own their land. They don't particularly want to own their land. They just want to grow on the land. So what they do have and what we support them with is to be able to get as long a as long lease as possible with low or no or peppercorn rent. Um, and sometimes that's directly with the landowner. Sometimes it's subcontracted um, through the organization who is occupying the land for housing or social housing, et cetera. It's often can turn into an asset transfer, but it's all more often than not, um, at least to begin with, until they've, until they've got established, it's more often than not going to be a asset transfer that um, is is not a buy buying the land. Although I have to say one of, one of the main granted grower group I don't know who knows them down in um, North Edinburgh they just got an uh, asset transfer from a local authority um, with help from Development Trust and I know that's taken two or three years anyway probably more. So it takes a long time um, and I think that 
being with people and supporting people as they dip in and out of our services is really, really important because you never know when any of this is going to pop up. Um, design, including infrastructure and how to grow all year round. And I think one or two people here have polycrops. And that I can tell you they're starting to spread. <laughs> They've come down from, <laughs> from the north and they're really spreading down here as well about how to grow year round. And we do we do some work with that. Peer advice and support, um, there's nothing better than that. So often what, what we do, either through the Community Land Advisory Service with Social Farms and Gardens or with the Get Growing Hello, Help at Service, a lot of what we do is signposting. So if you're part of the network and we know you and you sort of keep in touch, um, you, you know, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and support and exchange of information from us, um, but also more official Many of you will know the Community Learning Exchange Program funded by the Scottish Government through the Scottish Communities Alliance. That basically um, enables people to pay for their transport, but also the host to get paid for hosting a visit. So there's, we've got a few of them on the go at the moment, and we um, you can get that through our service as well. You can get that endorsed and get the funding for that. Getting resources, as Kate said, super, super, super competitive at the moment. Um, we do support funding. Um, anything from pointing out sources. We also have a small fund, the Pockets and Prospects Fund that we distribute. Um, and we also support people through looking at their, uh, basically reading through their applications just to have a fresh pair of eyes, whether it's lottery or whatever else um, and bringing tips. But the, the competitiveness, uh, increased competitiveness is worrying. So um, I, I think our advocacy work um, becomes even more important as we move into less funding sources and a tighter um, financial situation for all sectors. So advice from all this is that if you're growing, it's not going to be linear. You're going to be back and forth. Don't think that, you know, that the hurdles are, are not manageable because they are for most people, even if it means changing the way you do the land you have. If you've got the vision and a few people staying with that, then you will get somewhere. My advice, what I've seen working in this sector and working with everyone and having the, you know, it's a great, great, great meeting all people and their amazing vision. But sometimes I have to say that the vision doesn't always, it doesn't always um, reflect the community and the community sometimes doesn't feel part of the vision. And that can cause a lot of problems going into the future. So keep, Keeping in mind that as part of your vision is to be as open to your community as possible and to be as representative of your community as possible will will stop a lot of future issues. And it's hard when you're very vision focused, not, you know, sometimes to put your head up because there's so much to do to get going. But I would I would definitely recommend that. Now, as far as looking at the whole community growing side of things, um, opportunities for the community growth sector are also amazing. <laughs> There's more and more people identifying securing land, more land across Scotland. I think the membership when I started a few years ago, Social Farms and Gardens was 70, it's 400, and that's without having the resource to recruit members. That's just, you know, this is a growing movement. You're part of a growing movement. Um, we're seeing people working directly and earlier with developers, um, mostly housing developers, and getting you know, working as partners and getting what they need rather than being told you can have this. And that that's something that's very encouraging. We are um, working on a small project um, looking at um, National um, Planning Framework 4, which um, is a new planning framework for Scotland, um, and it will move um, de local development plans into a 10-year cycle. So it's a very urgent project. And that's looking at the local development and place plans and determining how we are going to support the growing communities to um to get kind of get up the priority list and and you know to get to get their noses in their, their projects and these plans so we've identified a couple of local authorities whose plans are up for renewal and there's consultation going on by the local authorities so we're getting involved with that to support groups to get their voices heard um and to really look at what what land is around and what we're finding is that a lot of people are collaborating locally um much more possibly also because of COVID supporting that, but they're being able to knit together um, some of the community-led initiatives, particularly around food growing and being able to, you know, develop enterprise models out of it. Now I have to say that Scotland, compared to my colleagues in Wales, where they've had a lot of, a lot of government funding over the last 10, 12 years, um, 
the enterprise models for growing and distributing food in a social enterprise capacity are not as well established as they are with my colleagues in Wales, it's particularly in Wales. So if anyone is interested looking at these models further, um, um, I will be working with my Welsh colleagues a bit closer over the coming year to look at some of the cooperative models, the um, all, all the different kind of community farm models that they that they they've been testing through the Welsh government funding. So if you want to get involved in that, do get in touch with me because we will be looking at how that plays out in Scotland, and we're already having some discussions with Cooperative Development Scotland around that as well. So, you know, how do we actually buy and sell some of our um, food um, in, in a social enterprise model. So I guess what, what we're seeing on the ground is even more, there's much more focus on us as, as growers um, because people are starting to realize, it, particularly in the policy space, um, that we occupy a lot of that because we're already delivering it. Um, and that's community empowerment, the new community wealth building bill, the net zero, the Good Food Nation Act. <clears throat> Biodiversity stuff, topics from social isolation to health and well-being. Um, we, we, you know, we can prove that we're benefiting and um, actually delivering to a lot of those. And I would, I would mention in particular, um, as part of our work with the Scottish Food Coalition, that the Good Food Nation Act is about to have um, consultation going on on the National Food Plan, and there's going to be local consultation at a local authority level, um, at every local authority, a local food plan, and. Um, stick with us because we were able to encourage you to get involved with that um, and to have your voice as community growers um, etc on that because that's going to be a big conversation going on over the next over a year um, a year and a half till September next year um, which will basically establish the Good Food Nation Act and what our role in it as communities is. So that's something to really watch out for, along with national planning framework. These things are all oh, oh, come and go, you know, flavor of the month policy, but it, it is a way to get funding. It's a way to get your voice heard. It's a way to get more land for all communities that I see potential in that really quite strongly. So if you want to talk about policy, please also get in touch. So I'll just spend the difference between Get Growing Scotland, because people often ask. Social Farms and Gardens is I would say more about the human in the environment kind of thing. Um, and it's a lot about the benefits of for uh, people in connecting with land and growing. Whereas Get Growing Scotland is very much about communities growing food. So there's a definite overlap. Um, so if it's about land, um, social farms and gardens run the advisory service. If it's about pretty much everything else, um, you've got Get Growing Help App where there's lots of stories, lots of inspiration, lots of opportunities to get involved um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and that, that I would also recommend this, that a lot of people don't know about this. The Social Farms and Gardens have the Facebook page, but the Social Farms and Gardens members have a Facebook page. And that is really, really good peer to peer. You know, I've just had a council ask me, has anyone helped? Um, could you find out if anyone in the UK has helped people um, in, how new, in new social housing get um, trained for um, uh, growing food. And, you know, we got somebody from Devon and they were like, oh, we probably don't have much to share. We're in Devon and ends up they've got all kinds of things to share um, to, to learn from each other about how to, how to make the most out of that opportunity. So we highly recommend getting on that. It's a really good page. It's moderated um, by us, but we'd leave it alone. It's members um, throughout the UK. So you can pick up a lot of things from the UK. Um, there's also a lot of webinars and a lot of the webinars, um, ranges of ranges of topics. I mean, well, loads and loads of topics and um, they're also um, held there as well in that um, on the website. So I encourage you, if we don't know the answer, someone in the network will, if you, you know, if you need support for anything around growing, whether you're a landowner or whether you are somebody looking for land and looking to start or develop your project, um, it's not easy. Um, but it's very, very valuable, as you've seen from the, the projects we've heard about. So um, really looking forward to having more chat with you now. But please do get in touch with us. And behind me is a whole host of people <laughs> supporting all of this. So and I'm sorry for the I don't know what happened. My my um, broadband seemed to go off and on about four times. <laughs> um, so um, looking forward to any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, 
our only question at the moment is whether we can get a copy of your PowerPoint slides. So if you're happy for us to share it, Karen, we're happy to send it out to the groups. Um, can I also absolutely, invite... absolutely. Brilliant, thank you. Can I also invite everyone to come back on the screen as well, because I think our questions are starting to come, come in now. Um, so we've got a question from Maria Della Torre. Um, Maria says she's very inspired to hear about the journeys of the two projects. Um, they put in an asset transfer request for a growing project. Um, so very pleased to hear about Karen speaking about access to land. Um, Maria would be really interested to hear about your asset transfer experiences. Um, Kate, can I ask you first, how did you find that process of transferring the, the asset into your ownership? Painful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and very long. Um, it, so it was, as I said, it's the first ever one that um, the council had done, and it was obviously the first one we'd ever done. Um, and it's due diligence on steroids. It's, uh, it's insane levels of everything having to be probed and proved and, um, and checked out. So it was it was long and hard and grueling. Um, we did get great advice from DTAS and um, and we really you know fortunately we've got a lot of really amazing folks sort of involved either directly or on the periphery of the ridge and we also have a really supportive council. So um, it was it was always a sense of you know this is going to happen. We've just got to work through it all together and make sure we've dotted all the i's and crossed all the t's. Um, and what I would say, though, is that it's absolutely invaluable for um, for anything in future that you want to do around that site. The work that you've done is, you know, you can just keep on pulling it out and you've got all of that evidence there for fundraising um, and for, for demonstrating to, to anybody that might want to query for whatever reason um, what you're doing. So it's really worth doing, even though it's painful to go through. The other thing is the land fund who, um, who financed the, um, the purchase also gave us money for a feasibility study. And the feasibility study has to be done by a third party, which is great, because <laughs> then it's somebody else doing all that work. Um, so obviously you have a huge amount of input into the feasibility study, but fundamentally it's somebody else producing a document which evidences um, everything that uh, that needs to be evidenced for the. Um, sorry, I should get rid of somebody trying to phone me. Um, it, it evidences everything that that's being asked for in terms of evidence. So again, that that document is a fantastic document to have going forward um, for for funding and so on. And also the land fund um, funds some revenue costs. So they were able to fund um, my salary for a period and um, various make safe uh, capital costs as well. So, so if you can secure land fund support for your community asset transfer, that reduces the pain a lot as well. Thanks, Kate. It makes a huge difference to have a supportive council, I think. To yeah, yeah. It makes all sense. the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and can I ask Karen, what's your experience of the groups that you work with? Are you seeing many going through the asset transfer process? Um, I'm seeing them go through asset transfer, but it is unbelievably slow. Unbelievably slow. However, there's been a couple of successes. It's just when you think you're not getting there, there's been two amazing successes in the last few weeks that, that I've heard about. So it's fits and starts, to be honest. I don't know if you found that, Kate, but um you know it just takes one turn of a page or one paper going to the top of someone's desk and things start moving again most mm -hmm. people that we deal with and we work i think it's worth pointing this out as far as support goes the development trust association has the cause coss and which is mostly about the cause service is mostly about um purchasing land um buying land where is the class service and there we work together with them the community land advisory service um that's more about um securing land rather than so usually lease you uh, lease but both of them go through the asset transfer when you're looking at local authorities more people are doing it um i don't think it's getting any quicker and it differs incredibly from local authority to local authority so um it's worth um getting in touch and we might know if somebody in a specific local authority who we, who's got some tips. <laughs> Lindsay, just to add to that, that we you know, we did a community asset transfer for the Backlands Garden and Blackwell Coast ruins. 
but we are taking ownership of the empire close and we're not doing a community asset transfer for that we're doing that um, again fully funded by the by the um, land fund but it, we're doing it as a negotiated purchase and the there is a, obviously a level of due diligence for that as well but it's nothing like as painful as a community asset transfer so I know you know there will be some some cases where you you're trying to take ownership of a site that maybe the owner does, isn't so keen to sell where a community asset transfer brings that you know, legal force behind it. But if you don't need to, I recommend avoiding it. I think that's a really important point, Kate, that sometimes a negotiated purchase from a willing private landowner can be a lot more straightforward than... Well, well it's from the council. The, the council own the site, but they're willing to sell. So, you well, know, that's, that's again, it's just to highlight that you don't have to do the community asset transfer, even with a, with a community asset transfer act body um they may be willing to sell and it, it's it's easier for them and frankly they're under the cost financially as well um and in terms of, of people resource so i think you know there's it's in everybody's interest as long as there's willingness to sell to try and avoid the community asset transfer process but but that said i think it's very useful in some situations thanks kate um if anyone else wants to put their questions in, just type the Q&A, but I'm going to ask a very technical question because it's one I've been asked a, a lot and uh, never know the answer to it. I ask a question of you, Diane, Stephen. Do you need to pasteurise the apples that you press or can you drink the apples uh, once they've been pressed without any treatments? We, 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 uh, we produce fresh juice, which we recommend consuming within three to four days but we also pasteurize juice as well. And we would say to people that that should store reliably for three months anyway, but we have got personal and anecdotal evidence of finding bottles in the back of cupboards that have been there for considerably longer, in excess of a year, that mm -hmm. have been absolutely fine. Well, it was very interesting you did both, because this seems to be a subject that comes up a lot at our conferences and leads to heated debates, so that's very interesting. Can I ask you as well, um, what do you think the difference is between kind of gardening in your own garden and coming and doing something as a community gardening group? Does it have a completely different, is it a completely different experience? Oh, definitely it is, yes, because you, you're working with a group of people and it's amazing how much you can manage to do in the space of a day. You set a list of chores and maybe a dozen or 14 people turn up and you get the whole list done, whereas it would take you days and days at home. And I think you're probably a lot more structured at doing it in the, you know, in that environment with volunteers than you might be in your own home, I think. I don't know what you think. No, I think that's right. But as a team, we get an awful lot more done than, than we would get from the same hours put in if we were just pitching up individually, for sure. Well, what, do you, what is your top tip? Like, what is the one thing that you've learned that really surprised you on your, as you've been learning about fruit trees and everything else that you do? Uh, Keep an eye on things. <laughs> Keep observing because you can you can let things sort of get out of hand or disease get out of hand or damaged by rabbits and hares. And I think, yes, you know, keep keep maintaining no good just planting a tree and just hoping for the best. But, uh, but I would add, don't be fearful of having a go. We had experts that gave us advice about pruning and they gave us very different advice. So there's clearly more than one way of doing things. And I think that sometimes people are a bit paralyzed by the risk of doing something wrong. Well, if you do something wrong, it grows back. And so, you know, I think as a, as a group, we found that, you know, we work at these things together, we share thoughts and we look at trees together and, and it works. And we've had, um, well, we've got a flourishing orchard. So don't be afraid. That's very good advice. Um, can I ask a similar question to Kate about um, if a community wanted to go down the same route as you, where you're doing lots of different things, working with young people, older people, um, doing training in your garden, what would be your top tip for another group that was thinking about going down this, this route? Um, gosh, I guess just don't listen to the naysayers, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, endorse that. Have a go and um, take take advice. Um, listen to listen to the experts. Make best use you can of of anybody that's willing to to get involved that has the skills um, and and is 
available and willing to, to give those skills and their time. But don't don't be daunted by the naysayers saying you're crazy, you can't do it because um, there, there's some there's some good uh, quotes isn't there about the, of the small group of motivated people are the only people that ever did change anything. So yeah, I think that would be my my advice. That's great advice as as well. Um, we don't have any more questions coming coming in at the moment. So. Um, what I'd say to people if they're listening, if something pops into your head after you've uh, gone away this afternoon, um, we can pass on the questions that you have to the, the speakers uh, who've been with us today. Um, but before we finish up, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all your speakers today, give a really uh, interesting range of presentations this afternoon. Um, and this uh, webinar will be available on our YouTube channel within the next couple of weeks. So thank you all very much and goodbye.